Coming to you from International Headquarters, Scotty DTV, but I was at the 2022 Detroit Auto Rama, and I ran into my buddy Mike Copeland up there. Now, he's the one that's uh, working on the retrofitting hot rods and things like that to run on hydrogen. Very cool. I'm behind it. I support it. I want to bring you all the information I can on it, and I also want you to know who's giving me this information. So I sat down with Mike up at Detroit and just asked him, who is Mike Copeland? For people that don't know, give us a little background on who he is. Very, very interesting. The uh, video may look a little long but i promise you if you all listen to it just for a few minutes i promise you, you won't stop listening to it a very interesting cat very cool for sure hope you all enjoy it let's get the camera turned around and uh, let's talk to mike copeland mike how you doing brother i am doing great how you doing scotty outstanding up here in detroit it's good to have detroit back thank god huh yeah you right know, two years without it it's it's like it's like a part of our spring was missing right yeah, no, it's it, for me. SEMA and Detroit are like the once Christmas time. Yeah, you know, because that's the big shows, and I get good content out of there. Yeah, there you go. No, it's uh, it's great to be back in Detroit. So good. And man, again, thanks so much for giving me some time this morning. Tell me just uh, so people that are not familiar with you, give me a little bit of your background and in, in how we got to where we're at today. <laughs> All right. So, uh, well, I've been a hot rodder, grew up my entire life. Right. I mean, it, anything to go fast from. From my dad was a drag racer and a street racer, and and I mean I remember in like 1964 sitting in the back seat of his Galaxy 500 dual quad 427 four speed car, and uh, he would street race. You know my mom, my sister, myself. We used to do that all the time, right? Really? So on Telegraph, Woodward, wow. right? You know I'm a Detroit boy, so we uh, did that. Uh, as I got a little older, I started racing mini bikes. I so mean, wait, let me just stop you there. So like maybe instead of where other people might go to drive in movie or something, y'all would go out and look for races at red lights? Oh, well, yeah, we'd street race. I mean, my grandparents lived on the other side of town, so we would take Telegraph or take Woodward to get there. And, and there was, you know, in those days, there was always street racing. I mean, early 60s, you know, I mean, I, I remember from being young, you know, driving home my dad had a 54 ford with a 406 in it and a three speed and i remember him breaking the transmission and we had to drive like 10 miles home in reverse because he only had reverse You're kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you know? and then my sister and myself sitting in the back seat of the car and he would be at a light and you'd hear him rev the motor up and he'd turn the thing loose and every time he would pull second gear i would kind of like climb up out of the seat and look out to see how you know how far ahead we were right, right. First time I ever saw a 65 GTO was him racing one, and the guy was beside him, and that never happened. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, we would go out and, and, you know, they would book street races, and, and my mom and my sister and myself were out standing on the shoulder of the road while my dad lines up with, with you know, somebody, and they street race down. My mom street raced. You know, I remember getting uh, I pulled over one night, her and a girlfriend of hers, and four of us kids in the back seat. She's running a Corvette and uh, of course whips him. And But anyway, we get pulled over, cop comes up. I, I still remember it today with him shining that light in the back seat and all four of us kids in there and going back for the light. And he's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> He let my mom go. <laughs> I imagine, right? You, they'll never believe this. No, so, yeah. yeah. So, but I, you know, that's the way I grew up, right? right? So I went into the mini bikes. I mean, I was as addicted as as you could be, right? I was a full on. If it burned gas, you were interested. In well, it. and even beyond gas, right? Oh. So, I mean, I was at 13 years old mixing nitromethane and alcohol oh, around no, in my weren't. mini bike. Swear to God, I was. <laughs> so, I still know how to mix nitromethane with gasoline. Well, yeah, but you're the man now. But you was a 13 year old kid then. <laughs> Uh, you know, we used to go to Ram Chargers and buy our nitro methane. It was ten bucks a gallon, and uh, we would go there. And that can was so cold, you'd drive, you know, drive home in the yeah. summer holding that can. And, right. You know, alcohol, nitro methane. I mean, we 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 played with you all of it. You screwed with right? it all. Yeah. I mean, it. You know, we were making our own connecting rods in in the in the early 70s. You know, when I was racing mini bikes, I mean, we would we would machine our own connecting rods, machine our own pistons. We would weld cranks up, you know, for a five horse Briggs and Stratton or right. Tecumseh or Deco, which was, you know, but we'd run them and then we put them on alcohol and then progress to nitro and then, you know, I ended up at the end. 
you know, before I retired from racing mini bikes, we were on 90% nitromethane. No kidding, on yeah. a mini bike. Yeah, they would throw like a foot and a half to two foot of blue flame out of the out of the exhaust pipe. Man, you, you, you ain't got none of those left, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I used to set my pants on fire all the time. Well, I would think stuff. you set yeah, a lot of stuff on fire with all that nitromethane in a 13-year-old kid, right? That's what we did, right? right. <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, I, then I went racing motorcycles and then I got into cars and uh, started drag racing and went broke and then uh, drag raced some more and went broke and got married, had a couple kids, still racing, started racing in the dirt, racing the mud, racing the sand, doing all that. I mean, I just, I, if it's got, if it runs on fuel and it's got four wheels or two wheels in some cases, I do it. Yeah. I love to go fast. Right? right, and that grew into my professional career. Right, yeah. I mean, that, you know, I you had to make a living. You never grew up, is what you're getting ready to tell me. Yeah, basically. You're you doing know. the same stuff that you was doing when you were a kid. You're just getting paid big money to do it now, right? <laughs> I'm paying kind of big yeah, money right? to do it right now, but and you uh, probably don't burn yourself as often. Not as often. Yeah. You know? No, and uh, my skin, I haven't knocked all the skin off of my body from flipping off of mini bikes or motorcycles in years. Right. So. Yeah. I'm pretty much healed up, <laughs> so, but uh, you know, I I, I just I, I love going fast. Right. Right. I don't care what it is. I don't care how it is. I mean, I've been 100 plus mile hour in boats. I've been, you name it, I do it. Right. So right. So, but my professional career, you know, I started as a dealership technician, and and fixing cars and worked my way up. Went into management. I was running a Ford dealer a service department with 50 technicians at 22. That's amazing. You know, I mean, I just you know, it's what my dad did. He ran another dealer, and and I followed his footsteps. Right. And then GM came along and uh, and made me an offer I couldn't refuse, and uh, so I went to work there. I was. Hand well, you're really a Ford guy at, at heart. At heart, yeah, yeah. I grew up a Ford. And guy. now you mess with Mopar some too. So I'm. You know, I'm. I, you're I, an interesting cat. I get that. But. Yeah, I'm kind of a. If it's American. Right. Yeah. You know, I'm all about Rear it. Rear-wheel right? drive or all-wheel drive. V8. Yeah, right, yeah. I, you know, to me, there's not a finer sound in the world than a V8. Perfect. You it know? is a perfect number of you cylinders that yeah. you want to make. I tell noise. people all the time, God created that. The rest yeah. of them, people screwed up. Right. <laughs> yeah, because tens and twelves sound good. It's just you got to turn like eight grand to yeah. get them to sound yeah. good. Yeah. Know? And even some of the V8 flat plane stuff. Right. So when I was at Lingenfelter, we built a turbocharged uh, LS with a flat plane crank in it, and uh, and it had a different sound. It and, does. But you know, it's still cool. Right. right? right. But uh, so I'm just thinking about getting a new Z06. So right. just to you know. You won't keep it stock. Well, why would you? Right. I, can't, I hope you do. <laughs> My fingers are crossed, actually. So, but anyway, I went to GM, worked there. Uh, as I said, I was an experimental assembler, so I hand-built the prototypes. Wanted to be promoted, wanted more. Told me I needed a degree. I didn't have a degree at that point, so I started. Uh, I was teaching education and training. That became my job. So then I developed an on-site degree program. So we put about 250 people through that. Let them get degrees at night. They would work all day, and then we go to class at night, wow. at, at right there in the in the plant, and uh, and got our degrees. Well, that's both sides of the business, though. You're not only a master on the mechanical side. It sounds like you got the administrative side. You're doing pretty good over there too well you, you know you got to yeah well right? most people <laughs> wish they could sure yeah. well you know it's it's not easy and i i still you know there's not many people that can turn a wrench and push a pencil to there's not right. right and that was always a huge advantage of mine at gm right so as the time went on at gm promotions and levels and all of those kinds of things i ended up i was uh, one of the lead engineers in the performance division so any of the one-off performance stuff if it was like a, a magazine car, or it was the first of a kind, you know. Well, a, tell them just a couple of the first of a kinds you put together. Uh, well, I did the the first of a, I did the first ever Pontiac Solstice. I did the first ever CTSV. I did the first ever ZL1 Camaro. I did the crate motor shootout where we ran eight engines in one car. I built the Reggie Jackson Camaro, which was the first ever LSX. I built, you know, I was involved in the development of E-Rod. I was in, in all of that, right? right? So a, a lot of the parts that were in the catalog, the accessory drives and all of those things, all came out of my work. So I created they all didn't of that. have them. No. You had to go make them. And yeah, figure it out and figure out what, you know, fasteners you use. And it, it, there's a lot more to engineering than most people believe. Right? I can't imagine what it takes to make an OEM car. 
I, to make it so finished and I'm still shocked sometimes we ever finished one. Right. Yeah, <laughs> you no. Know? Be it inside. And, it must have been hard deadlines with them or else you always. guys never would have. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, engineers always engineer. Right. It doesn't matter what you do, there's it can always be better. Right? So, it was so strange cuz I would go to the dealer like to buy a new car, right? And I'm looking at a car in the showroom and I got the hood up. I'm looking at it and I'm going, what is this? That We haven't used that crap for five years. <laughs> oh, wait, that's how far ahead we are. Right, right. right? So yeah. you see this, you know, different You're living whatever. in a different world. You're living actually, like you said, five or six years yeah. out. Yeah. And yeah. what you're looking at is brand new on the dealer showroom. You're thinking to yourself, this is just getting here, you know? Wait yeah. till you see what we got coming. Yeah, there's so much crazy stuff. Like, you know, if, if you follow... There was some V10 LS engines, right? right. Hell, I put those in. I, I don't need in in the, the what the mid 2000s. I built cars with those in them. I put right. the first ever one in. There was a V12. I put the first ever of that in. I mean, it was it was just you know we would build a new car that had those parts in it for the future. So if you sat next to the light, you had no idea what it was. Right, right. Right, but we built that stuff all the time. So you did, you were doing motor swaps basically on everything. Right. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, they brought you a platform and said, whatever, make it pass yeah. or make you it You know, there'd be a new engine, the high feature V6 when it came out. I built 12 different platforms with that engine in it. Wow. Right, man. I built the first ever car that had that engine. Oh, man, right? I mean, it was just, it was what we did. That yeah. was, that was our world. I was in advanced vehicle integration. So we did, as it said, all the advanced stuff. Then I moved to the performance division and built all that stuff and then uh, retired. Right. So but The first time. Yeah, the first time. Yeah, I've retired twice so far. But, At uh, least twice. Yeah. Well, pseudo others, but yeah, yeah official retirements right. too. But when I left, uh, so before I left GM, I opened my first company, Diversified Creations. And, and if you know, if you follow, we're the first people that ever did a Hellcat swap. We did uh, that. We built General Mayhem. We build for magazines and TV shows and and a lot of that kind of stuff. So, done a lot of that through the years. Diversified is just starting its 19th year. Holy cow! So, uh, my son runs the day to day of it. Uh, my wife works there now. But you know, when we opened, I mean, we were in 2,000 square feet, and you know, my son ran. We worked. We were open seven days a week. He worked every hour. Uh, I worked at GM. I would come in after work and build cars and, and install lift kits or superchargers or whatever it was. My wife worked at Nissan and she would come in every night and do the books and, and pay the bills. And, and that was just what we did, right? right? But we grew from 2,000 square feet to 7,500 square feet in two years. And I remember thinking, how will I ever fill up a building this big, right? Well, today I have 30,000 square feet. Holy cow. I have 11 hoists. I have, you know, And it's, it's worth mentioning, too. You all do from front to back. From yeah. You can do interior. I mean, you're known for performance. But even me, I was like, well, who builds these cars for you, Mike? And you're like, we build them. I'm like, no, I know you put the motor in and all that. But, I mean, the car, it's got a great fit and finish. And who does that? We do. Right. And there again, that's an odd thing because the guys usually that can make them fast don't care what they look like as long as they're fast. Yeah. But, but you have an eye for detail and fit and finish and everything. Yeah, we're a one-stop shop. Right. right. So and then I own Arrington Performance as well, so we have that under. It's it, we have opposite ends of the building, so I have like 17,000 square feet at one end and 13,000 square feet at the other end. I have you know salespeople and I have technical people and I have you know I've been able to surround myself with some really really good people. Uh, that helps a lot. In my own personal career, I've been able to work with what I consider some of the smartest engineers that, that exist. Right. I mean, I, I've learned so much from so many of those people. I mean, you know, when they knew, when they, you can sit down with somebody that knows metallurgical, you know, it knows all of the fasteners and what the specification, right in their head, right? Uh, I got to work with a suspension engineer that probably at one point had done 80% of the suspension inside GM. Wow. And I sat down with him and asked him a question one day. And he started drawing on a whiteboard in five minutes. He was speaking another language because he had left me behind. Right? No kidding. He was just so smart. Right? right. But you get to work with those people and you learn from them. Right. You know? I know we're going to talk about my hydrogen program. Sure. But my chief engineer was a guy that was a friend of mine at GM. We were kind of partners in crime. We did a lot of stuff together. He's he's arguably one of the two smartest engineers I've ever met in my life. Really? He's just so smart. 
man, I can't imagine. And he's a I machinist, think I, I'm too, I'm saying the same right? thing about you. <laughs> he's so smart. This dude is this crazy smart and, and motivated, and, you know, it's the whole it's the whole package, Mike. Yeah, so, but yeah. in 2011, I retired from GM, and I went to work at Lingenfelter. So I was the vice president at Lingenfelter, so I ran that company basically for a little over five years. And uh, we had some great successes. You know, we did all the DI program development, direct injected for the GMs. We did the Reaper truck line uh, off-road. I'm a big off-roader too, so, right. so I, I actually engineered all the suspension and all of that stuff in that whole program. So, so even after you left GM, GM still was utilizing you. They were just going, have to go somewhere else to get your talents. Um, yeah, I don't do much for GM. Yeah. I mean, you know, some so when you were, so, so, the, so the things you were talking about were Lingenfelter. Those were Lingenfelter. Oh, okay, programs. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. All right. But, you know, we do some work for Dodge right. and, and that kind of stuff. So we built some cars for them. And so, like I say, we did the first ever Hellcat swap in the world. Uh, the Charger that's in our booth here at Autorama is our 12th Hellcat swap. Wow. So, but, um, you know, after Lingenfelter, I retired. I was, again, after five years, I was going to try and retire. I burned myself out. I mean, I was working... You know, I traveled 41 weekends a year all over the world. I mean, I was in Dubai, I was in Abu Dhabi, I was all everywhere, right? right? So I've raced all over the country. I've been lucky enough to do that. I've looped a Corvette in the bus stop at Daytona. Oh, no kidding. I've run Road America. I've done, yeah, yeah. yeah, that was easy for me, evidently, right. Phil. But, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, uh -huh. but I've got to go, you know, run closed highway races in, in Nebraska. And I mean, I, I've been 183 in a Corvette on a on basically a two-lane, you know, paved road and, and a one-mile shootout. I, right. You know, I got to do a lot of fun things. Very blessed, sounds like. I am, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, but, you know, I when when I retired the last time uh, from Lingenfelter, that was in 2016, the plan was to s just stay semi-retired, but I'm not good at retirement. Obviously not. You know, I was out about 16 months that I was what I call myself retired. I built three personal ground up complete builds for myself wow. in that in that 16 months and then uh, so you were killing your bank account on top of not being happy yeah yeah <laughs> right? yeah, that was money. actually really a struggle dealing yeah. with that when I retired because I I'm not rich and I'm not poor right. right but when I retired from Lingenfelter I didn't have any income and it's the first time since I was 14 and uh, I really struggled with it personally I mean I not knowing that you weren't getting a paycheck and, and all of that kind of stuff. I mean, I was too young for Social Security. I was, I just, I just didn't, you know, my GM retirement, I was letting sit, all of those things. And then, uh, I, I, I mean, I didn't even want to buy dinner. I didn't want to spend 20 bucks buying dinner because it was scared. like, yeah. it's just weird what, right. it, what you go through with, well, in your I mean, own when, mind. When right? you're thinking in your mind that yeah. this is my pile, all I have left, and every time I take a 20 out of it, there's yeah. not another yeah. one going back. Yeah. A yeah. smart man does say, hey, yeah. maybe we don't need to go eat out. Well, then I figured out that if I just wrote out lists of parts and gave them to my son, he would get them ordered. They would show up. My wife paid the bills, so I didn't have to know what we were spending. Oh, I got you. Right. So, yeah. so I just spent. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, but anyway, I get a phone call. I'm driving up north. I get a phone call from Kim Pendergast, who owns Pendergast Partners. They're an equity firm. And they owned, uh, she owned Magnus and Superchargers. She also owned Arrington Performance. So this is in 2017. So she calls me up and she says, uh, you know, she had, we had had a lot of conversations. Arrington was struggling a little bit. She had tried to hire me to come run it, but it was in Martinsville, Virginia, and I didn't want to move. My life is in Michigan. So we went back and forth, and, and she says, what do you think about owning the company? Now, this is on Friday of Labor Day weekend. And I'd already done due diligence on the company because I had, it was kind of trying to help them grow in, in a little bit. And so we talk about it. I had her, we emailed stuff back and forth over the weekend, talked to my wife, talked to my son. We were at my place up on the sand dunes. And, uh, and so I called her on Monday. We were driving home, and I said, I'll take the company. Oh, I said, actually, what I told her is I'll make you two options. One, I'll come for six months and try and help your people build the company. I'll help develop your marketing programs. I'll help do all those things. I said, or I'll buy the company. And she preferred that I buy it. So on Wednesday, I was in Martinsville to meet employees and tell them what the future of Arrington was and where we were going. 
Right. So we moved it to Michigan, built a new facility, did all of that, and uh, it's here, and we continue to grow that side too. Right on. Well, we're going to get into hydrogen chuck. We've, I, I want to make two videos out of this, actually, so I want to inspire people to let them know that uh, I didn't want to just show up, guys, with this hydrogen chuck and you you thinking a crock, crack pot made it. A lot of times, this kind of stuff is done by hippies in their garage. And before I got into this, because I know it's going to be controversy in, in some ways, I, I wanted to introduce you to Mike Copeland. And as you can tell, he's an amazing dude. I'm, I'm just blown away that he even knows who I am and if he has just a pinhead of respect for me then I've done my job right because all I ever wanted to do in this industry is be a positive influence and to be able to stand next to the godfather of the ZL1 Camaro and the CTSV Cadillac I mean you heard that folks you heard that straight the very first one of those cars that were built for GM they came to Mike they gave him a sheet and said this is what we wanted to do wanted to do go make it happen make it work and so um, we're going to get into it he's got some really cool technology coming on with this hydrogen so there's going to be a separate video for that but again the introduction to Mike Copeland hope you all have enjoyed it see ya Well, make sure you subscribe to this channel and visit scottydtv.com for an easy way to search the hundreds of videos I have posted. Either click the link in the description or the one at the end of this video.